From where do the Western constellations originate? Those patterns in the night sky that are at the core of Western astronomy and which volumes of pages in the humanities and sciences have been founded, all from fragments of barely readable documents and passed down through poems and references to earlier texts. We will explore this important question and perhaps find some answers in this presentation of Paleolithic constellations. First, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work at this year's European Society for Astronomy and Culture Conference. My name is Bernie Taylor, and my research explores a deep root to mankind's creative capacity by looking at how hunter-gatherers and ancient peoples viewed their cosmos through the study of archaeoastronomy and mythology in Upper Paleolithic cave art. Starting closer to the present, we generally consider that Claudius Ptolemy's 48 classic constellations in his Almagest were compiled from the works of Eudoxus, Aratus, Hipparchus, and other Greeks before him, as well as Mesopotamian sources. Yet it is curious that many of the ancient Greek constellations do not speak of an urbanizing culture which developed advanced mathematics and built mechanical devices. These constellations do not appear relevant to the agricultural Mesopotamians either. Where did the mythical centaur Sagittarius and dragon Draco fit into the cosmic views of city dwellers and farmers? These characters are more closely associated with shamanic or animistic hunter-gatherers who found kindred spirits and other animal beings, geological formations, the sun and moon, and stellar patterns in the night sky, many of which they mixed and matched. To help us better understand the minds of peoples, who could have readily believed in man-horse beings and giant reptiles that interacted with humans, let us now travel into a deep cave tens of thousands of years ago when animism was the dominant belief perspective. This cave is El Castillo in a mountain of the same name on the Iberian Peninsula. Where on the 10 meter across panel called the Gallery of Discs, there are more than 80 red discs that are on average about the size of the palm of your hand, one disc among them has been dated to at least 34,000 years ago. On this panel, we find an archetypal teacher and apprentice. Note the wide, interested eyes of the apprentice and how the teacher speaks into his ear. Perhaps he can tell us more about the mind of an animist and earlier sources of constellations. Let's listen in. Also listening in on the shoulder of the teacher is a fledging golden eagle that stands about a foot tall. This is roughly a mid to late June time period for the young eagle. There's also this masked cosmic man whose left leg and arm are raised. The right hand holds what appears to be an egg. His left arm has a feathered texture. We can take a closer look at the mask of the cosmic man. Note that he has one eye on the left side of his face and the right is the beak of an eagle. One can see the impression of a nose below the mask and what appears to be a mouth and teeth above a dropped chin. When we turn our head sideways, the teacher in the fledging golden eagle transform into the mask of the cosmic man. See how the artist used the juvenile eagle to form the beak of the cosmic man's mask. This is animism. On this panel, we find a speckled mare. She appears to be leaping with her head turned as if agitated. Our cosmic man merges with the speckled mare to become what the ancient Greeks would have interpreted as a centaur. He is now on his journey or adventure. We encounter another transformation where a mask is put on to become a birdman or avionoid. Note that our hero's left hand is feathered behind his back. This is also the feathered left hand of the cosmic man. They are the same character. On our journey, we encounter a mother Iberian lynx with a slightly tipped head and whose kitten pushes up against her ruff. This is a mid to late June time period based on the depicted stage of the kitten and is consistent with that of the fledging eagle. We enter a marine environment where we encounter a giant crab lurking under a ledge. There is a spinning bottlenose dolphin. Note that the dolphin is depicted above the surf. Our hero merges with the dolphin to become a merman who is reminiscent of the shape-shifting old man of the sea in the Hercules myth. We find our hero appearing to be in the air. How does he elevate above the water? The artist reveals that the dolphin assists him. In this image, our hero wears a red pelt. We may be getting ahead of ourselves in the story. We reach the opposite shore, which is now Western North Africa, to be greeted by a monk seal. Where there is a woman in distress, 
see her sunken chin and cheeks, sorrowful eyes, and long braided hair, accentuated by the red discs. When the damsel in distress archetype is encountered, the story is evoked. The surrounding characters fill in the cast. There is a spitzish dog with its tail flopped forwards. Present-day DNA studies indicate the spitz to be one of the oldest known dogs. We encounter a Barbary ape, which is indigenous to the Atlas Mountains of Morocco. And a juvenile giraffe who hides her neck behind her mother's. The giraffe is indigenous to Africa. There's also no evidence that the giraffes were in Europe during the time of the cave artists. There's an elephant drinking water from a pool and another with a raised trunk, or so it seems. Turn your head sideways and you'll see that they are the same elephant the artist formed from the same ear and trunk. Our hero enters and swims in the pool, see his head and arms freestyle swimming. Our strong swimmer's moving head shows him coming up for air between strokes. He encounters the elephant in the pool. The artist depicted an arrow view of the elephant in water with her floating ears. Our hero rises again, but this time walks up a hill at the top of the panel where he encounters a lion being licked by a lioness. Our hero is unsure about whether he should approach them. Is he ready to battle this apex terrestrial predator? There is an inner conflict, the crisis moment, where our hero battles with himself in a different time and place. This may be the upper Paleolithic version of the ghost of Christmas past. The lion takes the initiative and paws our hero to the ground. The hero prevails, becoming the apex predator. And as a symbol of that great strength, he wears the red spotted pelt. This depicted myth is, of course, connected to that of Hercules who slays the Nimi lion in a deep cave and takes home the bloody pelt as evidence. We continue on to find a mother bear watching her cubs climb a tree to safety. And then encounter a large crocodile. Who is protecting her young? Our hero gets mixed up in the affairs of the crocodile, but appears to stay away from her sharp teeth. Perhaps our hero is trying to steal an egg from the crocodile, such as the one she holds in her sharp teeth. This is a daring venture. There's an ostrich that appears distressed about something. Isn't that how we think of ostriches today? Some perceptions never change. When first working on the ostrich, I didn't see the legs and thought that the bird looked a lot like a floating swan. Remember that idea. We will return to it later. There's another bird, the now extinct great auk, which indicates that we've returned to a marine environment and are homeward bound. On the journey home, we see a breaching humpback whale. Know that the whale is depicted above the surf in the same manner as the dolphin. Our hero rides home in the belly of the whale that is reminiscent of the biblical Jonah and the whale, so that our great epic story can be passed down to a new apprentice by the now wise man teacher. On our journey, we have found that the gallery of discs depicts terrestrial animals that are indigenous to the Iberian Peninsula at the top of the panel and the Atlas Mountains of West North Africa on the bottom of the panel and marine animals in the middle as oriented in this direction. This tradition is carried forth to the present where we use animals and characters of them to mascot political and geographical regions, as well as athletic teams and educational institutions. By following that upper Paleolithic map of animals, one can walk and swim from Cantabria, Spain to Jabotobacal, Morocco, over about 30 days and roughly 1,700 kilometers in each direction. Jabotobacal is the highest mountain in North Africa and was called Atlas by people in the ancient world. This is the mountain that Hercules and Perseus climbed, and we find Barbary apes today in their native environment. The stretch across the Strait of Gibraltar takes about three hours to span for a strong swimmer. The strait might take a little longer if one is playing with dolphins. This journey was not just across land and the Strait of Gibraltar. We can turn back time to mid-June some 35,000 years ago with Starry Night Pro 7 and astronomical software to see these depicted human and animal beings on the gallery of discs in the night sky's constellations. We can recognize many of them in the ancient Greek astronomical record from Claudius Ptolemy. Traveling from north to south at the top of the panel as oriented in this direction, we have the mass cosmic man who is the constellation Hercules. The eagle that he merges with is Aguilar. The eagle also merges with the horse that is Pegasus to give her wings. 
in that great astronomical expanse we call the sea is the bottomless dolphin Pisces, which is swimming southward. On the southern shore is the seal, which the Greeks found to be the monster Cetus. I suppose that if one heard a seal in the dark, it might sound monstrous. More pieces to the puzzle can be found near to the southern limit on this image, where our hero, Orion, is accompanied by the spitious dog that is Canis Major. There is the elephant, whose head is Aruga, and the tusks are Taurus. The ancients substituted a horned bull for a tusked elephant. Our strong swimmer is the constellation Perseus, who swims along the Milky Way. Hercules, Orion, Perseus, and perhaps the wide young-eyed apprentice in the place of the constellation Antinous are the same character on this hero's journey, with each depicting the hero at different stages of the journey from north to south and back north again. See how Orion has replaced Hercules as a slave of the Nemean lion. They look different, partly because the constellations are shaped differently. The eyes of the Barbary ape are the twin stars Castor and Pollux in the constellation Gemini. The constellation Leo is the Nemean lion in Greek mythology. What I described as a lioness, which is clearly like in the lion, was probably interpreted by ancient peoples as the single head of the hydra. The bears are Ursa Major, oriented as they were in the summer months. The crocodile is Draco, and from where dragons derive from. This depicted crocodile has a length of about 15 meters, which would surely make it as threatening as any dragon in Game of Thrones. The ostrich is Cygnus. Remember that an ostrich without legs looks a lot like a floating swan. If you have never seen an ostrich or missed the legs on the panel, this bird could be interpreted as a swan. Early Greek astronomers called Cygnus the bird, hen, or swan, perhaps unclear of which bird species this is. The whale is Pisces traveling north and in the opposite direction of the dolphin. Both the dolphin and whale were both depicted out of the water so that they could be found in the marine environment and in the night sky. The pieces to our pictorial puzzle all interlock. The upper Paleolithic cave artists formed new constellations through the mixing of other constellations. For example, the overlapping of some constellations may have been later interpreted as wings of the eagle Aguilar for the horse Pegasus. Sagittarius may have been developed from the overlapping of the man Hercules and the horse Pegasus. Additionally, there are common spatial elements between the Upper Paleolithic and the ancient Mesopotamian and Greek records, such as their astronomical sea, where we find marine animals for both Pisces and Cetus, as well as the Greek Pegasus, which was created by Poseidon and arose from a sea. We may now look back at the inventories of known astronomical records and compare them with the upper Paleolithic characters. The two overlapping pictorial animal being constellations characters between the upper Paleolithic cave artists, Mesopotamians, and ancient Greeks as highlighted in red are the lion Leo and the eagle Aguilar. These are exact matches in both time and place. Pisces is curious such that the Mesopotamians and ancient Greeks found fish in the astronomical sea, but not the dolphin or whale as Pisces, traveling south and north respectively. The ancient Greeks may have already had Pisces as fish and gave the upper Pelagic dolphin a place in the sky as Delphinus. Neither the Mesopotamians nor the ancient Greeks appear to have known that the astronomical sea was the Strait of Gibraltar. Pisces could have been designated as a match between the three cultures as well. I'm sure that everyone here is familiar with the mother bear observations of Ursa Major in Hesiod, the book of Job and among Native Americans in different regions across the continent, indicating pre beringia migration knowledge of this constellation. Ursa Major as a bear in the upper Paleolithic inventory confirms that hypothesis. The archaeological and astronomical records indicate that ancient Mesopotamian and Greek astronomers shared some, but not all their constellations. There are at least 14 constellations and recognized stars in total borrowed from the Upper Paleolithic between the two, as listed here. This suggests that multiple sources of the ancient Greeks and Mesopotamians had either visited the El Castillo cave and or there are other Paleolithic caves that also depict these astronomical images and which were visited in ancient times. I'm working on another Upper Paleolithic panel with many of the same constellation characters. There are also more characters on this panel that we do not have time to discuss today. They are lost constellations from the Upper Paleolithic. If anyone has a recommended change to this list, please email me. 
exactly where the ancient Greeks obtained their constellations in their inventory has not been entirely clear, which can be somewhat explained in the Upper Paleolithic record. We do have records of what the Mesopotamians had, namely Moapin, but that is only a partial story. The ancient Greek narrator prior to my work is that the teacher of Eudoxus was the Egyptian priest Shinopius of Memphis, according to Plutarch, and his astronomical knowledge was ultimately passed down to Claudius Ptolemy, who looks as though he has a secret to hide in this portrait. There were earlier documented astronomical characters, such as Orion and the Great Bear, as found in the works of Homer and Hesiod in the 8th century BCE. The astronomical record of Eudoxus, as found in the poems of Aratus, is not as complete as Ptolemy's Agmas. I believe that some of the Upper Paleolithic constellations were resourced from the Upper Paleolithic caves by the ancient Greeks and other peoples who had seen them and then passed them along to the Greek astronomers. Which constellations were we found after Aratus is unclear. Aratus did write of Draco, which is also found on the Gallery Discs. This suggests that some of the Upper Paleolithic constellations were known to Eudoxus and points to Shinopius as an earlier source. I believe that we can now move beyond the Upper Paleolithic as just the domain of primitive man whose only abilities were stone tool making and high levels of art. The Victorian perspective of an intellectual and cultural hierarchy among peoples today and in the past has crumbled. The Paleolithic mind is still our own. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak at this year's conference. More on my work can be found at these sites. I am always open to cooperate on projects and virtually present my work to community and academic audiences. A pre-recording of this presentation will be posted to my webpage.